Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the session of the 2020 Postal History Symposium, sponsored by the American Philatelic Society, the American Philatelic Research Library, the Smithsonian National Postal Museum, and the United States Philatelic Classics Society. I am Susan Smith, the Winton M. Blunt Research Chair at the National Postal Museum. Our presenters for this afternoon's session will be Diane de Blois and Robert Dalton Harris. Their talk is titled, The Special Postalization of Locale. It is my great pleasure to introduce Robert Dalton Harris and Diane de Blois. Robert became a full-time dealer in postal history and ephemera in 1973. When Diane joined him in 1979 as a writer and editor in other fields, she was particularly keen to have him restart the publication, A Gathering, P.S., a quarterly journal of postal history, and she took over as editor with volume two in 1980. This research journal continued for more than 60 issues to 1993. In 2000, Diane and Robert accepted the editorship of the Postal History Journal, for which they won the American Philatelic Congress Diane de Boire Awards in 2004 and 2014. The couple separately and together have written on a broad range of subjects for other philatelic and collecting periodicals, and both are members of the Philatelic Writers Hall of Fame. From 1999 to 2010, Diane served as director of the Ephemera Society of America, for which she has also served as the annual conference chair since 2005. From 2007 to 2012, they both served on the research subcommittee of the Museum Advisory Council, the Smithsonian National Postal Museum. They have a long-standing habit of exposing non-philatelic collectors to philately and shared the Ephemera Society's highest award, the Maurice Rickards Award, for their continuing efforts to promote understanding of historical and cross-disciplinary importance of philatelic objects through well-researched, readily accessible writings. In 2008, they won two awards from the American Philatelic Congress, the C. Corwith Wagner Award for their writing and the Jerry Hess Barr Award for presentation. They also won the 2016 Luff Award for Distinguished Philatelic Research from the American Philatelic Society. Please join me in welcoming Robert and Diane. There was a postal revolution in the United States in 1800, the establishment of distribution post offices. Now at the micro level, the concomitant strategy was the availability of special post offices served on special routes, connecting to the network as a whole. The special postmaster would have to be content with the usual commission on the gross revenues of his office. The special route contractor had to be willing to perform the services for the remainder of the net revenue of the office. Now, new post offices rarely generated enough revenue to pay their regularly contracted service. So the innovative nature of this provision allowed for expansion of the network without cost to the government. It would also serve to make adjustments for the systematic development of new transportation corridors, for example, turnpikes and railroads. So a post office had been established at North Bergen in northwestern New York State in 1833. We can imagine Sila Hobi, Assistant Postmaster General in charge of contract arrangements, poring over the official postal route map, looking for any named community that was not connected by the regularly contracted services. And North Bergen was not. So Hobi, reaching out to the postmaster asks how and from what point your office is supplied with the mail the name of the contractor and whether it's on a private or public route once hobie knew north bergen truly did need a postal connection he signed a printed cover letter to connect to a contract announcing that a horse langdon would be the carrier but asks the north bergen postmaster to add the proper dates. Now that Langdon is named to carry the mail, a contract for a special route is drawn up. The dates, December 16th, 1834 to December 31st, 1836, added and signed before a Justice of the Peace. We have amended uh, David Burr's map with a new special post route connecting North Bergen with the postal system at Byron. 
Now, North Bergen's contractor could earn no more than $4 per mile, per mile and not to exceed the net revenue. But here, for Southampton, New Hampshire, special route contractor Joseph Graves complained that his compensation wasn't enough for the six trips a week he was making. And such frequent mails were unusual for special contracts. Instead of allowing more money, the post office department's contract office suggested reducing the number of trips. Now, the new railways were signaled by a new classification of mail carriage, the mail messenger, they carried from the depot to a nearby post office. With the advent of the railroad, Millville, New York, would now get its mail from the railway depot via, via mail messenger in J. Belding. And even the mail messenger would be limited in his compensation to the net revenues of the office served, in this case, $60. The identity of special contractors and mail messengers could be found in the official registers, depending upon the period. Now, on the left, at Great Works, Maine, Owen Smith was the special route contractor, receiving from Postmaster Barton $13.75 for the quarter ending in June of 1855. In that year's official register, he is listed as earning $50.55 per year, and that's perhaps a typo for $55, which be, would be the four times $13.75. At Hartford, Connecticut, Emery and Henry Downing carried the mail to and from the railroad depot. Postmaster Hammersley paid the men $64.15 for the quarter ending in March 1855. That year's official register, they're listed as having earned $276.65. In the same period, the Hartford Postmaster Hammersley was compensated $2,000, leaving net, rev uh, net postage of $15,000, $149.94, out of which the mail messengers were paid. Mail messenger service was well designed for small offices, but clearly was useful even for the largest offices being serviced by the railroad. Now, if you look at the columns of amount earned per, per year of special contractors on the left and mail messengers on the right, one was mostly in tens of dollars and the other in hundreds. What we've shown so far are the kinds of documents that one is astonished and grateful to find from a few small offices, but we have, as a matter of fact, quite a full record for the special office established at Shrewsbury, Vermont. Now, Shrewsbury didn't exist in the 1790s, but it would grow up on a post road between Windsor and Rutland, the two most productive counties of Vermont for gross postal revenues. We see three large post routes leading from Boston to the Connecticut River on this map. The southernmost through Worcester to Northampton, the next one north through Lancaster, Marlborough, New Hampshire, and Keene to Walpole, and the third through Andover, Concord, New Hampshire, and Plymouth to Haverhill. Now, when Shrewsbury was established as a post office in 1809, it was given to lie at the Y intersection of two post routes coming from the Connecticut River, the upper one from Windsor and the lower by Walpole, New Hampshire, via Bello Falls, Vermont. The mapped area we're looking at now stretches from the Atlantic coast at Boston, lower right, to the northern border of Vermont with New York and Canada, upper left. And with respect to Boston, routes into this domain had to negotiate both the Connecticut River and the Green Mountains into the Champlain Valley. Now, turnpikes proliferated in the first decades of the 19th century, local interests hoping that economic progress would follow the road, and the government's wish that post routes be served by stagecoaches added an incentive to improve the roads. Shrewsbury might have been a small village, population of the whole township in 900, uh, was 990 in 1810, but the post road on which it lay reached from Boston through Nashua and then followed the second New Hampshire per turnpike to the Connecticut River, bending north to cross at Cornish, New Hampshire, and then a path from Windsor, Vermont through Plymouth. This connection to Rutland, a main route north to Canada, rivaled the parallel connection by the first New Hampshire through Concord, New Hampshire. In the 1830s, Nashua, which used to be called Dunstable, 
was industrializing at the confluence of the Nashua and Merrimack rivers and becoming more important as a communications hub. We have a continuous record of the retained copies of the quarterly accounts for the postmaster Dunstable for more than two decades in office. This gives us a more finely grained picture of an office's business than could be found from official reports. In the first quarter of 1833 shown here, on line 18, the postmaster has paid mail carriers one cent each for a total of 36 letters picked up on the way. All will have a one set way charge added to the postage calculated from their respective points of origin as indicated by the carrier. Those for handling as incoming mail would be reported on line three. We can calculate that 14 or 10, depending upon which multiple you choose, of the 36 letters were destined for delivery at Nashua. Now, in any event, this <laughs> demonstrates a coordinated accounting for letters well beyond the eight hours or perhaps 50 miles traversed by one carrier. For instance, the one letter from more than 150 miles probably originated in Hartford upon a consortium of stage lines gathered to carry the mail along the Connecticut River. Evidence of such necessary billing coordination among stage lines is here in 1830 seen in the division of passenger fare from Keene, New Hampshire to Boston over the several lines on what was called the Jaffrey Road. Watts, Emory, and Staples are credited for their share of the $2.50 passenger fare. This accounting was kept by Thomas A. Staples. Now this same Staples handled several stage routes and in 1840, the upper image, carried passengers and mail between Boston and Brattleboro going through Rutland, traversing the Jaffrey Road via Keene and connecting to places as far afield as Burlington. Local interests connected to staging the taverns, the stabling, were strong enough in New Hampshire, Vermont, to delay railroad mail contracts, as well as to coordinate closely with their development. The lower image is an 1842 way bill shows that the stagecoach line picked up passengers at Lowell that had, who had been taking the railroad. And in 1844, Staples was granted a contract to carry the mail aboard the Fitchburg Railroad to Keene. We drove from our home in West Sand Lake in the Hudson Valley into Massachusetts at Williamstown, along the Mohawk Trail and the northern breadth of the Commonwealth into New Hampshire, crossing over the Draftry Road. We spent the night in Nashua. This was our projected route. From Nashua, what was called the Boston Post Road, subsequently carried the Amherst Turnpike. In the 1810s, it completed a continuous turnpike route over the second New Hampshire to Claremont, where it joined a post road traveling up the East Bank to a bridge from Cornish, New Hampshire to Windsor, Vermont. At Windsor, the post route through Shrewsbury had never been turnpiked. So here we begin. In Nashville, we took the Amherst Road rather than the Concord, and soon were easily lost among a welter of old roads. Houses as old as the 1799 turnpike were sometimes a clue. At other times, the signage itself saved our project. At Amherst's Village Green, the town meeting house built in 1870, or 1774 had become a congregational church in 1832, as it remains. Six miles further is Mount Vernon spelled in the French way, with its general store. Not as old a community, its post office probably waited for the turnpike's completion. Now, a common style of turnpiking was to feed the waterways by the shortest route, rather than following the lay of the land that would have governed the connectivity of settlements. And the second New Hampshire turnpike that we were following between Mount Vernon and Francistown remains a straight path over hill and dale with little settlement in between. At Francistown, the meeting house on the left dates to 1803, soon after the post office opened. We confidently set off to Deering on the unpaved for farm road. That way effectively dead ended after six miles. Backtracking and recalibrating got us to Deering on another unpaved road. Deering's town meeting house 
on the right, was completed in 1788 and served as both town hall on and non-denominational church, from which the Congregationalists seceded in 1899 and built their church in the center image on the green in 1830. By the 1850s, Hillsborough Bridge was served by the Contoocook Valley Railroad from Concord. And on the bottom right, the stockholders in April 1851 moved their meeting to Henniker in the next county northeast. This connection would favor Concord and the fourth New Hampshire turnpike on the route from Boston to the Connecticut River rather than the second New Hampshire through Nashua. Though the first mill at this Hillsborough Bridge site was established in 1828, an earlier house of 1817 by the bridge is celebrated in left at bottom. And the most recent mill building of 1865 has been turned into apartments. You can see them at top left. The hosiery mill race still provides electric power to the community today. Proud buildings in Washington. The Congregational Church at Wright was built Gothic Revival style in 1840. On the left, the schoolhouse is newer, an 1883 addition to the village green. To the right behind the flagpole is the town hall, a meeting house built in 1789, well before the turnpike and the establishment of the post office in 1802. Lemster's Universalist Church of 1845 on the left became a library. It's Congregational Church of 1828, a museum in the middle image, and its 1794 town meeting hall on the right still serves its purpose. Unity's post office was established in 1818, three years after Samuel Chase, three years after Samuel Chase paid tax on a pleasure wagon, his receipt at top left. As the Lempster post office dated from 1814, these two communities were probably given offices as the turnpike reached them. Unity's town hall on the right with Paul Revere Bill was built by a Baptist church as a Baptist church in 1831. And the sign shows us that the birthplace of the famous Salmon Portland Chase is in Cornish. Crossing the country's longest two-span wooden covered bridge, built in 1866 replacing several others, the earliest being 1796, confirmed that our path had been conserved almost as a vast deja vu. And entering Windsor, Vermont, we found the base of the old post road on the side of the River Never Turnpike. Brownsville and Reading both favored brick architecture. The 1815 house at Reading was actually built as a stagecoach tavern in 1806 in 1815, becoming a Masonic Hall, and it's now a B&B. &B. South Reading, with its outcroppings of granite, favored stone structures, as with this one newly renovated 1840 Congregational Church and several houses. President Coolidge's family ran the General Store Post Office in Plymouth, Vermont, shown at the bottom right. Our final lap was over a pass in the Green Mountains, through the Coolidge State Forest, and adjacent to Shrewsbury Peak. The path to Shrewsbury is now unpaved and not maintained in the winter. Shrewsbury Village itself preserves its early 19th century sense of connection. Created in 1809, its post office had a favored position at the junction of two post routes until both routes were finessed by the railroad. The Rutland and Burlington Railroad basically followed the right of way established by the Green Mountain Turnpike from Bellows Falls, crossing the crossing from the Bellows Falls crossing of the Connecticut River, whose bridge was built in 1785, taking a river valley crossing of the Green Mountains between Ludlow and Heldville. Up to this point, it was essentially the old postal route, but in the town of Shrewsbury, this river routing avoided Shrewsbury Village. One and a half miles away is Cuttingsville on the river, the village formerly named for its postmaster, Levi Finney. Puddingsville getting the railroad eclipsed Shrewsbury. Changes in the, contract, in the contract routing for the post offices shows and data from the official registers recording postmaster compensations and net postages. When the railroad reached its Cuddingsville in 1849, the postages treble, while those at Shrewsbury remained consistent with its history. Note also during this period the effects of postage rate changes. 
But in general, Finneysville lagged behind Shrewdesville as a productive office until the railroad boom. And the arrival of the railroad in 1849 coincided with the reclassification of the post office at Shrewsbury. Lowell W. Guernsey, a local physician, perhaps related to the former post office at Cuttingsville, was named postmaster, his duties the same as at any other post office. The post office at Shrewsbury had formerly been in a tavern kept by Stephen Gleason, the first postmaster since 1809. Perhaps Gleason had used his own scale to weigh a mail way male batter, but Guernsey is receiving an official model from Rutland. Montpelier as the state capital was apparently also the distribution center for postal supplies. Here, Postmaster Guernsey receives a mail bag. By the appointment of a carrier, the specialness of Shrewsbury is now complete. Contractor Bella Pratt agreeing to handle the mail three times a week for no more than $35 a year, not to exceed the net proceeds of the Shrewsbury Post Office. Now, Pratt was a farmer and a shoemaker living towards North Shrewsbury and most probably had reason to frequently travel the several miles to the larger town of Cuttingsville. Postmaster Guernsey is instructed how to handle payment to contractor Pratt and that the limit was $8.75 a quarter in 1850, the post office department gave Postmaster Guernsey permission to change Pratt's schedule, probably for better connection to the railroad, and also gave him permission to obtain the mail oftener in person. He was a local doctor, and we imagine that he had had other reasons to travel between Cuttingsville and Shrewsbury and pick up the mail. But Postmaster Guernsey soon felt overburdened with the 1851 reductions in postage rates, less consumption, less, less, less compensation for more work. So you can see here that he says that the excess of letters received under the new law for the first three quarters, um, he is getting 332 more. And then um, at the, he says, in addition to the above, there's been an average of more than 60 weekly papers free for delivery to the actual subscribers. And then he swears that this is that all this calculation is uh, accurate and that his commission diminished by $15 and 13 cents. As a result of the greater work. As a result of such problems, some adjustment is made to augment all postmaster commission, commission schedules under the operation of the new postal law. New and better mail locks and a more stringent oversight of the keys were part of recently adopted security measures. Bella Pratt will apparently continue to serve as the special contractor for the next four year letting period and the maximum pay has been reduced by $10 from $35 to $25 per year, probably reflecting the reduction in net revenues after the increased commissions to the top Shrewsbury was small enough that postage stamps and envelopes were not supplied until compulsory prepayment in 1855. The first shipment was $15 worth of stamps, then $20, and plus another $16 of stamped envelopes. When Postmaster Guernsey retired in 1859, he recorded handing over his accumulated postal equipment and paper, Alonzo E. Horton signing for it on January 1st. We remarked that 18 pamphlets of laws and lists must have included ones saved from Gleason's tenure since 1809 in the Shrewsbury office. Horton's special contractor would be James M. Cooper a Shrewsbury blacksmith. The emolument increased to $34 from 25. In 1881, Cuttingsville Post Office was itself served by a mail messenger from the railroad depot who earned $100 a year. And the post office in Shrewsbury is to be found on a regular route, 21, 33, between North Shrewsbury or Northam and Cuttingsville. Nathaniel Aldridge, the first postmaster at North Shrewsbury from 1871 
kept his office in the store that you see here, which he had built in 1865. The Pierce family, famous locally for their cheese, bought the store in 1918. It is now a village cooperative. And there we are in the village <laughs> store. Changing the status of Shrewsbury to special gave the community a postal bridge from being not on, on not one but two pioneering postal routes to being finessed by a railroad route and once economic activity in the area increased to being served again by a contract route. At least until 1909 when personal transport with automobile and truck would link Shrewsbury with the railroad depot in Cuttingsville and the post office closed. Of the 11 New Hampshire villages we drove through, once connected by a turnpike track, seven no longer had post offices. But the villages survive in that quintessential New England way, residents finding both the will and the funds to keep their historic buildings in good repair, structures that housed religion and education and government by town meeting. Thank you so, so much. Wonderful. I'm jealous that you got to travel at all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so thank you so much for that talk. Um, so uh, the first question is, I, I think I understand how your research informs your travels. How do your travels inform your research? You probably need to go a little more deeply than we presented here, what exactly we were doing. Uh, it's sort of keyed by our introductory statement that there was a revolution in the United States Postal Affairs in 1800, and that's not a usual statement. Uh, that derives from uh, a footnote in Richard John's book, spreading the news uh, in which he credits such a the, such a thing to the United States Post Office in, in an academic discussion and relates it to the distributing post offices. And the interesting thing is that no one knows about distributing post offices. And even after you find them, how do you know that there's, is there any evidence of them? How do you feel about their existence? Uh, they're, they're listed in the front of the, the manuals uh, that the postmasters had. Uh, okay. Such as the, uh, the, the settler, and they were the places to which the mail was to be sent in order to be gathered and uh, exp expeditiously transmitted to far reaches of the country without traveling through every intermediate place. It was a it was an immense step in developing a system that could grow and that could respond to a a huge change in the geography of a country at the same time as a exponential change in the number of letters which are being sent. This essentially set up a whole framework for operation which predisposed the subsequent growth of the postal system exponentially for 200 years and it later made necessary the adoption of new technologies such as railroads in order to keep up with the explosion of the mail but we find that this this infrastructure how do we find evidence of that infrastructure you know we in our and it, it, that is, how do we find evidence at the local scale of what is happening, it, it, how we are entangled in a distributed way with the system at large? And so we looked at this, the, the sort of least of the post offices, such as the special post offices and so forth, to see if they could be canaries in the coal mine of this question and to show the way in which far away events and the determination of routes and rates and roads and so forth might affect their actual history. And so we sort of delving into these the local stories and trying to find that reflection of the larger story being present, uh, uh, you know, sort of through the web uh, at the local scale. So your travels then along this route to these towns Give well, you a sense of distances, or are you? We found dead ends. We found roads that had passed out of existence. This was once the highway. It, I mean, we sort of posited Shrewsbury backwards. Shrewsbury was a point where the road forked, going from Vermont toward the Connecticut right. River. It was a huge, you know, a big deal there. You chose your path, right. like Robert Foster, whatever. And right. uh, no, I mostly what. Well, what we wanted to, to feel or to discover by driving it was that sense of geography mm -hmm. and how at one point it was seemed perfectly reasonable to go on a more or less straight path 
from Nashua all the way to Shrewsbury. It's not reasonable anymore. It's you quite long. It. it takes a whole day. <laughs> okay. Even, um, one of the interesting things about travel is that we uh, we regularly travel across country to California. And many years ago, we met an academic, wonderful man who lives in Los Angeles. And uh, his father, who was a philatelist, died. And when it came time for him to um, do something, sell or otherwise distribute his father's things, he, of course, thought of us. And he brought us a box of postal documents. And there was this whole clutch of wonderful resources about Shrewsbury. And he jokes about it now because he'd never seen people just open up a box and go, oh my God, look. <laughs> Very, right. Yeah, right. We, we all, it, it was sort of happenstance that we also had the Nashua end of this story, but it sort of, we had to go with what fell to hand. And this is very much in terms of uh, Scott Trappel's reference to the stuff. If we start from the stuff and build our story out from the stuff, we're going to find connections perhaps what we're looking for, perhaps what someone else is looking for, but in any case, that's how we were proceeding. Yeah. Okay, and to follow up on that, you two do a lot of very fine work with maps. What are the particular joys of working with maps? Oh, they're so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, boy, we do a lot of traveling, and there's gotta be a navigator, right? <laughs> You've gotta be able to trust the navigator and so forth. But we, uh, the fine work we've done with maps also involves really getting into them, you know, getting down onto the surface of the map and tracing the road where it is going. Does it go anywhere? And if we follow it, do we get there? You know, mm -hmm. sort of as we found not necessarily so anymore. It was hard to get maps. It was hard to find maps which would allow us to see the roads we were traveling on, uh, let alone. <laughs> and that's part of the joy in maps, to be able to see the layering of of a particular area it, certainly and maps too are you know they are sedimented i mean there's a map for every day <laughs> in some way that that, uh, that shows the connections whatever you're looking at in this case geography but the so having a, a pile of maps over time of a particular area gives you a sense we're getting overlays of the postal routes of mm -hmm. the turnpikes upon the postal routes of the railroads upon the turnpikes uh, or not and whether or not those overlays are made are frequently the locus of a great big story, usually a great big political story, which involves people who have stakes in which way, which route is chosen. So yeah, the map is a very active field for sort of recording that kind of mm -hmm. investigation. Are the postmaster's quarterly reports available from an online source? That we found out yesterday, I think, yes, I think they're all digitized, perhaps from a certain year. They're, they have been, they're in reprint. Uh, should, uh, you said quarterly postmasters. Quarterly. I was yeah. yeah. No. no, 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 no. Okay. The, the what we were referring to as the quarterly accounts of from the postmaster to the department were there abstracted into yearly things, and largely when the post office burned in the 1830s, those things disappeared. And uh, it's okay. yes. We have the postmaster amazingly retained his own copies of those reports, which is the extraordinaryness of okay. them. They, and was Lyme, New Hampshire, one of the towns served by a special special post office? Uh, that, that I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, I don't know. The, 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 the question, these kinds of questions, which one would love to be able to say, go there. Sometimes you can say that, but with respect to this question and the broad range of data, only some of the tabulations of special contractors can be linked to the offices they serve. They just did not provide that information in the official registers until 1881. Then we can see okay. in detail what offices were served by what contractors. At an earlier period, uh, very helpfully, in the contracting materials themselves, after the numbered contracts were all uh, listed, there was a section given to uh, the, the people who were willing to serve for the special post offices, and those bids are sometimes given, and those tabulations we found among the mail contract reports that Congress was required, required to give. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So many different places potentially to yes. look. Okay. We, the, we gave some of those details in 
you know, right. on the slides. Uh, we, we intend to certainly use them as much as we can. Okay. And you talked of mail messengers carrying between railroads and post offices. Was there a maximum distance that a mail messenger was allowed to carry or to I, travel? I it's a good question, and I think it's a complex question in particular, but in general, uh, the, the, the Carl Steely tells us that the mail messenger was normally applied between both boat depots and railroad depots and the post office. If the post office was within a quarter of a mile, it was expected that the transportation agency would be responsible for making making the mail go that distance. Sometimes it's made an explicit condition of the contract, reading the early contracts and so forth. Sometimes the post office is left to provide for those things themselves. And in that case, it's usually given to a contract between the post office, which is to be supplied uh, out of its own contingent funds, paying okay. for the for the mail messenger to the office beyond a quarter of a mile uh, probably out to a couple of miles depending upon the large this the size of the city beyond that and to small villages this was special contracts would carry from the railroad people for example okay and do you think your approach to research uh that the writer has written research path be duplicated for most of the routes of the 1790s on for other states no and I could see a lot of real good reasons. And there's a the question of really how the post office serves the people is a very regional question. It certainly does serve people in New England, New York and New England, much differently than it served people in the West or in the South. In New York and New England, the people were English. And they had, as uh, an earlier presenter emphasized for us, expectations of what a postal service was and what it could do. And also they had the political establishment. The townships were there before the people got there. And the means of providing a point in the township, a town center, town hall, was already part of the expectation. You had a town, you had to have a town hall, and there was going to be a post office there. Then that allowed you to connect to the county seat and the county seat to the state capital and the state capital. All of that administration was so quickly and so effectively implemented in New England is really what this partly is to show too, very rapidly as well. But with a lot of this uh, deep interaction between what was on the ground, the people who had strove to uh, progress in these terms after they'd taken all the trees and raised all the sheep and so forth, and, uh, and how they're gonna continue to be progressive in New England. On the other hand, if you're interested in any particular place or area, look it up in in the contracts it really would be interesting to trace the main postal contract in your route by driving it oh, i do it all over well, well, certainly country. this could be yeah. done but it would be it would be to different results well we would hope it right. would be and then you would we would see there what the different distributions affect right. you know in terms of the, how the people grow up in them the, the author of the question was particularly interested in central pennsylvania Oh, I oh, think so. Yes, oh, yeah. yeah. The, the, one of the crucial keys to our work has turned out to be the census. And the, the, okay. the, the census was conducted by township and is reported by township. You can probably find it places online. You can get it out of the gazetteers for the areas that we've studied. The, sort of every once in, every decennial census, there would be a spate of gazetteers and you, the township populations, you can, you can track this stuff at that Pick that pixelation. Most other sort of official reports don't allow you to get down to the township, but once you've got the township populations, you can start to really build something up from that level. Okay, well, you've inspired several people clearly to think about this type of work. So what other types of documents and where would you look for the documents? So you had a wide variety of archival materials effectively uh, in your presentation. That we do, we make our own collections of such things, just as, uh, with a little broader scope than most postal historians would. We've done so far in the county in which we live, and we include stock certificates for turnpike companies. Oh, they're delicious. <laughs> How do you find them? You just wherever. Look. <laughs> that, that doesn't help, Robert. No, I don't. <laughs> but, but more specific. <laughs> Um, well, Do you put we, a call out for, for we're looking for materials yeah, well, for this region or? Yeah, yeah because we've okay. been in the rare document business for 40 years, um, all the dealers in such documents 
uh, recognize that we would be keen buyers if they find any such. And so that's that, how we that's really a key. We have served to bridge two previously separate fields of, of the pursuit of material culture in various ways, and mm -hmm. that no one in one as antiquarian booksellers, for example, uh, to as Mr. Postal. <laughs> uh, not the only Mr. Postal, but if it was weird, you'd, it was the only, we were the only ones, the, the documents. Yeah, okay, great. What types of materials are you hoping to find for this project that you haven't yet? Oh, <laughs> it, it's hard to hope for something of the kind that you we might find, but the, one of the real keys was the stuff that came around the, uh, around the stage coaching, those those waybills, those are the most common things. They were they're almost dogs to the eyeballs for anybody in postal history because that the, the only thing that's out there and no one has bothered to put them together. But we started searching the web and we found that people still had clutches of the wherever the trove of that documentation of how the stagecoach companies coordinated their businesses among one another in order to serve long distance responsibilities like you know going all up and down the Connecticut River in time with the railroads whenever and they were coming uh that was uh, you know that that opened up a whole area to us an area of understanding and leads us now to want to follow this question about the way letters and how far away could a way letter be billed you know evidently the way letters were coming into this office which were coming from way further than the person who was handling them to the postmaster so they were being billed by the stage companies they were as they were you know gathering their relationships in conjunction with the long period you know, so that's a letter given to the stage driver in boston maybe with the instruction that he wanted it to go by nashua rather than how it would have gone by normal distribution up to hanover and over to concord because he knew something particular about the, how the different mails arrived and, and he wanted to get it, you know, had an hour, perhaps it was to another address just south of Concord. He would have, the people would know that kind of thing and would seek uh, or would have developed relationships with the carriers to, uh, to, to make those connections according to their, you know, whatever were the laws. In this case, those letters had to be billed if those people were carrying them. So, yeah. right. Ta so tactical, tactical mailing. Yes. Right. Yep, nice. <laughs> yes. okay. That's interesting. Great. Yeah. So we'd also like to find out more about the um, RFD um, it, yeah, how these, routes in uh, this particular. A area. lot of these places no longer had post offices, but we have not gone to how many of them are well, they probably all served uh, postally, but within oh. what, how, whether it was subsequently through RFD or, you know, they just became part of a big urban city delivery thing near Rutland. So with a project like this, how do you know when to stop researching oh. or searching? It, Good there's not a done. We know there's not a done right. part. This is a project actually that has several different lobes, which has been going on forever. You know, the National Post Office part, we've been studying that. That's one of the first things that Diane ever did. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the the business with the Shrewsbury is the one that Diane recounted uh, getting the batch of documents that made it relevant, falling into mm -hmm. this idea that the special office had something to tell us more than just a weird, you know, uh, you know, appendage to the postal system. That the special office had something to tell us came from our deeper appreciation of that footnote in Richard John about the right. distribution and, and how some of the most important things that were happening to make the U.S. postal system U.S. and not British or French or somewhere else was was particularly this this technique of uh, uh, managing the design of the connection of the mail schedules uh, in order to pass uh, collect the mail into distribution offices and then to send them in closed mails you know to the distribution office appropriate to the delivery of the which vastly simplified all of the intervening space uh, the, in the confederate post office for example they uh, they discontinued distribution in order to save expense and coordination and so forth that would, that would have been required and do you have any idea what the qualifications were for the mail qu carriers or what? They had to be, the, the, the postmasters had to be bonded. The, the, the postmaster okay. business with the government was the bond and the mail carriers, typically the, 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 it would have had to sign an oath uh, and also to, I, th I think there was a constitutional oath, I don't know when, 
that I've seen constitutional oaths, civil war period certainly, uh, but but a, an oath to you know okay. do the job. And, okay. And the bond to the postmaster's bond, I think. Uh, I don't know how far if if it's if it stand for the carrier. I doubt it. No. I, I think the carrier must be independently. Okay. Okay. And will you be exploring postal locals in other areas or in additional oh. states in the future? Well, we have we have in past. This is reports on work we've reported previously in the 2013 Congress book upon how this attaches to some of the other questions. In particular, how, for example, in Indiana, when and there's you know when you find a nice postal history work where there's been a lot of foundation done, like railroads and when and where, then you can start mm -hmm. looking for the mail messengers and the special post offices, which would have had to have erupted under those circumstances, and finding them then fill in a whole part of the foliage of mail service that would have been otherwise missed if you were only uh, leaving yourselves. Yes, and we did it. Uh, from the state of Missouri, uh, looking at the relationship between the establishment of newspapers and special offices, because of typically the very sparse post offices in the West there would be a county seat and a post office there. If there were to be any other office, there weren't enough people to make it to warrant the expense, but they could have a special office. And they would often want to have a special office if they were wanting to publish newspapers. And often, if there was one newspaper, there were two newspapers. So you had these okay. special offices, perhaps two special offices, hosting different newspapers attached. You know, that kind of thing becomes hmm. a, a sort of hiding uh, bushiness to the postal systems, right. really responding to the postalization of the locale. That's what we, you know, that's why we chose those weird words. <laughs> I, I was going to ask about that. Thank you for the explanation. <laughs> you did. Go, you did. <laughs> well, thank you very much. This has been wonderful. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate it. Yeah. Good night. Farewell. And wanted to thank again um, the hosts of this event, the 2020 Postal History Symposium. Thank you to the American Philatelic Society. American Philatelic Research Library, the National Postal Museum, and the United States Philatelic Classic Society. And um, join us in thanking uh, Diane and Robert for this wonderful talk.